Well, hello everybody, and you are very welcome to this episode of Fantastic Female Fridays. I am super excited to tell you about our guest today. It is Laurie Winkless, and I have so much to tell you about her. So, first of all, I'm going to start from the end, and then I'm going to work my way back up. And then what I'm going to do is start at the beginning and work my way back down. But before I do that, of course, what I'm going to do, as I always do, is just check in here with everyone and see where you're all tuning in from. I see that we've lots of people here. Hello, Maria. Delighted to see that you are present. Fantastic. Um, and please do, please do tell me where you're tuning in from, uh, from all around the world. So, like I say, my name is Susan and the show Fantastic Female Fridays is all around women and investing. But of course, we love when all of you fabulous men join us from around the world as well. The rationale behind this show is that there are amazing women doing amazing things all over the world in amazing different areas. And what I wanted to do was use this show to showcase them, first of all, to get a lens into the world, to see it from women's point of views, but also then to apply it to the investing world. Now, today I am going to be talking to the physicist Laurie Winkless, and we're going to be talking about a variety of things, particularly around how science and business interact. Now, Laurie is a scientist and physicist to her fingernails, whereas I'm a businesswoman through and through. So you'll see where our two worlds collide uh, in a happy way as, as we go along. So I'm just going to pop on over here to the chat. I see Bob is tuning in here from Stratford in Canada, Will is tuning in from Alabama. Robert is tuning in from High River, Alberta. Maria, of course. <laughs> Maria is here from Maine. Honestly, Maria, it's always great to have you here. And thank you. Tom is tuning in from Austin, Texas. Super. Keep them coming. As you know, I always, always, always love, always love to hear from you and to hear where you're coming from. Ah, hello, Julie. Julie is joining us from London. Laura used to actually live in London. Julie, she lived there for, for 12 years as well. So you might even know her. It's a real Irish thing to say, actually, isn't it? Um, so... For as regards how this session is going to run, let me just explain. And of course, if you're joining us from either live or if you're watching this on YouTube after the live edition has been streamed, you are super, super welcome. And of course, you're always welcome to comment afterwards. I'm going to first of all begin by telling you a little bit about Laurie. I'm going to tell you a little bit about her work and how I met her and why I asked her to come on the show. Um, and also, I want to tell you a little bit about her book too. It's called Sticky, the, sorry, the most recent book. It's called Sticky, The Secret Science of Surfaces. And, um, but there's, there's a lot more than that to her, which I'll tell you about. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring her in. Now, I have to tell you this. Laurie is joining us live from New Zealand. Do you know how early it is in New Zealand? I know how early it is in New Zealand. And I particularly know because I got a Dear Susan pre-dawn uh, email from her this morning. She is now in her Saturday. Uh, we, of course, are still in our Friday, depending where you're tuning in from. Speaking of which... Jim says hello from Calgary, and Julie says that's so funny that we might know each other. You might, Julie. You never know. You never know. For anyone, I see there, there are numbers have just jumped up. So for anybody who's just joining, please do pop in where you're tuning in from. We're always happy to hear from you. Over the course of our conversation with um, Laurie this evening, this morning, wherever you are, what we're going to talk about are the changing nature of the science that we can look at in the world around us. And like I say, I'm going to look at this from a business point of view and I'm going to put a range of questions that I genuinely wonder. I'm going to put those to Laurie so that we really do get an insight through her lens. And then afterwards, after Laurie leaves us, then well, I'm going to take you through some market developments. Of course, there's been a lot of those since I spoke to you last. I'm going to take you through some market developments as well as applying what Laurie has to tell us. And like I say, I'm keeping a very good eye in the chat. Anytime I look over here, um, I'm, I'm looking over your heads basically and onto my phone over here because that's where I'm, I'm monitoring the chat. Last thing before we get right into this, we would love if you like the episode uh, because of course it always makes it easier afterwards for people to find this conversation. So we'd really appreciate if you'd like, um, if you'd like the episode. If you're on a phone, then you need to press X on the chat, pop back out and press the like button and then come back again in, into the chat. And of course, also, please share the episode either as it's happening in WhatsApp groups or on Twitter or wherever you might be hanging out socially. Um, because, of course, we would love if we, you could spread the message of the show far and wide. OK, so now let me tell you all about her. And I see more people have just joined us. You're more than welcome. Right. Let me start at the end and work back up. So Sticky, what is this about? Well, bo this book is basically a book about stickiness. 
And I was just telling somebody about this about an hour ago and they said like, how do you write a book about stickiness? Now, I'm not going to answer that question with the woman herself to do that. But having read some of it, I didn't get through all of it yet, but I will. It's all about how things stick to each other, as you might expect. But to give you an example, and Laurie is such a vivid writer, like she talks about rock art and how art has actually lived on certain rocks for over 1600 years. And she describes this idea of where she's standing in a cave in an hour outside Sydney and like there's <laughs> there's barriers up to keep people like Laurie out now, right? But anyway, so she's standing and her, she's keep getting her face as close as she can to the rock. And as, as she's doing so, she hears a parent and a child behind her. And the child says, oh, this is really cool. I'd like if this art was to be on my wall at home. And then the dad says, maybe, but it won't last as long as this one. And this is ultimately what, in, what is intriguing to her is how can things stick to a certain sur a surface over that period of time. Uh, and also as well, I, there's one, one specific statement that, that, I, that I noted here that I wanted to share with you, right? Because I think this is something, I, I was wondering if this is a metaphor for life for a start. Uh, but secondly, I think this applies to all of us investors. And I'm just going to quote you, quote you this line. She says, how well a paint bonds to a surface depends just as much on what it's sticking to as what it's sticking with. And I think there's a lesson for that in us all because we may be the best possible investors from the point of view of analyzing stocks or thinking about how we will apply our searches or looking at dividends or being vigilant to earnings or looking at press releases or various different things. And that is what we stick with. We use our education, we use the VectorVest program, that's what we stick with. But what we're sticking to, of course, has a really big influence as well. And that's why at, uh, afterwards I'm going to talk through what's going on out there in the stock market at the moment. Um, because, of course, that is what we're sticking to when we put our money into these various different assets. So this show, believe me, I can bring a lot of diversity to you, but it all ties back at the end of the day to, to the conversation. Other things that, that Laurie has done is that she is she's also written, written a book called Science in the City. And if you check her out on YouTube, she has this great video for three minutes where she's in a hard hat. Right, the hard hat is nothing comparison to the big massive tunnel that she's standing in. She's saying, circles are really great. And you hear her excitement about the shape of a circle and how it allows the distribution of the weight to be very helpful when you've got an awful lot of mass lying down on top of it. And I'm going to ask her about the changing nature of cities throughout our conversation as well, because our relationship with space has changed, particularly urban space has changed as a result of COVID. So I wanted to talk to her about that as well. I see the numbers keep rising here. You're all super welcome. And thank you so much indeed for being here. Pop us there into the chat and let us know where you're joining in from because we, we always love to see where people are tuning in from. The last thing I want to tell you about her, although there's a lot more, but the last thing I want to tell you about her is I first met um, Laurie. And I say first met, it feels like I've kind of known her longer because she's so authentic on Twitter. You really get a chance to interact with her. And in her bio actually on Twitter, she says she's opinionated. She is. <laughs> That's all the more reason why I'm having her on the show. But I first met Laurie, um, we were both working at an event in New Zealand at the time. And uh, it was a day, it's all around women. It's St. Bridget's Day and it was a day that the Irish Embassy were running. And we were both speaking at it, uh, I in a very different capacity. But in Laurie's case, she spoke, uh, she, her, she was tasked to speak about herself. And I just remember her standing up and saying, but while I'm remarkably interesting. I really actually think that there's far greater women that have come before me. Now, I don't really know about that, but all the same, she said there's far greater women that have come before me. And what she did then is, as a result of that, she went on um, to then say that she was, um, is that she w went through various different scientists that came before her all along and with such excitement about it as well but she really 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 knows her stuff really and truly she knows her stuff so well that I just thought I'm going to get an opportunity someday to interview her and you all thankfully are here to witness that so on that note what I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce her as I say she's here live from New Zealand we're so delighted to have her and da -da -da -da, here we go Laurie <laughs> Oh, here, sorry, here we go, I should say. Now, there we go, there we go. Hello. Lincoln, live from New Zealand. It is super indeed to have you here. Thanks so much indeed for being here uh, and so early. And first of all, of course, you've been in the green room there while I have been describing your um, your biography. Tell me, how much of that I got right and what else would you like to add in there? 
No, that was pretty spot on. It was actually very flattering. So thank you very much, Susan. Um, yeah, I'm a bit of a jack of all trades. I uh, started life as a physicist and I uh, transitioned out of the lab a few years ago. And I, I now work full time as a science journalist and communicator. And I, I train other scientists and uh, in how to communicate. So yeah, a bit of, bit of a jack of all trades now. And it certainly wasn't the career path I thought that I would be on, but I'm enjoying it. Well, we can see that, and I'm sure all of our audience here will see, see that indeed. And maybe just when, when you talk about the changing nature of your own career, Laurie, maybe if we, if we start mm. there, because I, I'd love to hear from you. What are the new emerging careers? Um, and, and actually, I'm going to ask this to our audience as well. Can, can you tell me, and everyone who's joining us, what are the career titles you've come across recently where you thought, oh, I didn't know there was somebody that did that, or that's an interesting title. Um, what do you see the emerging careers are in, well, physics and, and science and even broadly in STEM? Mm. I think the major thing that we're seeing is people who have, who are coming at a science career with multiple disciplines. It used to be the case, you know, that you'd specialise pretty early on in your education and in your training as a scientist. Um and that would mean you're kind of very much in a particular box and that box just fits within a wider machine. But I think that is less common now. So within the STEM sector, we are seeing people whose work sits right at the interface between things. You know, maybe they are someone who is an engineer, but actually they their background is in zoology or, you know, they are designing um biological molecules but actually they come from a computer science background you know they're doing it in silico as we say they're doing it inside a computer and that is something that I don't think that traditional kind of science career advice would tell people you know you have this idea that you're just supposed to pick one thing and just be an expert in that and that is increasingly rare in science people are much more likely to have expertise and knowledge um, in different disciplines. And it's much more exciting because often, in my opinion anyway, um, often that's where the most interesting, most dynamic science is happening, where traditional traditional topics actually sit and overlap with one another. Mm, okay. So, and I, I see that that then is bringing everything together, um, bringing in silico, that's the first time now I've heard that, that term. So bringing, <laughs> bringing all of those, those terms together uh, or bringing that multiple perspective, I think that it's, it's, it's also, uh, we talk a lot about diversity these days and, and diverse perspectives. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to pop on over here. So Marie, Maria says hi and she's waving at you. Dennis says, Susan, my volume is very low. So I've just turned that up. And Dennis, you might let me know if that has improved. And uh, I'll keep, keep an eye on that. I appreciate I pr appreciate you, you coming back to me on that. Um, Laurie, when you say that you never intended doing this job, how then have you ended up doing this job? <laughs> As a kid, I just wanted to be a scientist. I just wanted to study science. Um, and that was when I came to kind of applying for university options. Physics was, was right at the front of my list. But I'd also always been a diary keeper. You know, I've always written. I, I've i always written. I've always loved it. I always loved telling stories as a kid, too. So I did. There was a, a moment where I wondered whether I would study journalism or physics. And really, in conversations with people like my parents, um, it just made more. It became clear to me that I, if I wanted to, to become a scientist first, I really needed to get some good grounding in the physics. And, and maybe, maybe I could continue writing um while I was studying physics. So there's always been in my head, those two things have always sat alongside one another. And then when you work in research, you spend an awful lot of your time writing. You know, you're writing research papers, you're writing proposals for projects, you're writing news stories about your work. You you write a lot. You have to communicate your research effectively in order to attract funding. So being a good communicator was very useful in the world of physics, but it was still very much you know, one level down from from focusing on trying to learn my physics. When where it kind of shifted really was I worked at the National Physical Laboratory, which is a big lab on the outskirts of London, kind of West London, not far from Heathrow Airport. And that lab is a huge facility where I learned I learned how to be a scientist, really. I didn't learn that at university. I learned that there. But one of their priorities is doing science outreach, is doing communication to wider public audiences. And they really encouraged us as scientists and enabled us to go out to the community and talk about science. And I le leaned into that rather heavily and, you know, and they encouraged it and they, 
you know, the, every time I had a new opportunity, they were like, yeah, go for it. So I got to be on The Naked Scientists, which is a really brilliant BBC radio show. And um, for a, a little period, I was like their physics correspondent and I got a little taste for that. And um, and I just started doing more and more outreach. And um, very, very long story short, that became something I knew I wanted to develop more formally so that it wasn't just something that I was doing on the side in my evenings and weekends. It's just my, app. It, you know, it was something, science is my passion. And I knew that I needed to develop those skills a bit more and then got an opportunity to work with the Nobel Foundation, like the, the Nobel Prize people. Um, and that was a really cool experience working with them. And that was my first kind of non-scientific job where I wasn't doing scientific research. And during that time, I was approached by a publisher but I was approached by Bloomsbury uh, Jim Martin there was looking for new voices in science writing uh, they just started doing popular science books and that started me down this path yeah so it has been it's been a case of I've never been I've never been risk averse in the sense that I I will make a decision based on a lot of <laughs> I think about things a lot but when I leap it's with confidence that I can figure it out um, and that was kind of how the move from from research into science communication started and also the you know the leap into writing books kind of came from that too it's like I can figure it out I can do this and do it very well you do and I'm I'm not just saying that from my point of view one of the questions that I have for you as well tonight is around science in the city your other book and mm -hmm. there was one particular quote that stood out to me it's Dame Jocelyn Bell uh, I know a, a woman that I've actually had the pleasure of interviewing myself before and I know I know a role model of your own but Dame yeah. Jocelyn Bell described in that that you point out the technology that we're going to need in the future to underpin our urban landscapes so yeah. as we're all joining here this evening and morning and with a view to understanding how the how the future in front of us Laurie is, is changing very quickly so maybe could you point out some of the technologies that you're talking about and how you do think that they can change the way in which we live yeah, for sure. Um, Science and City was kind of something that I I was living in London when I wrote it, so I was very much motivated by you know the built environment and and moving through that and what it meant for the future. There's a couple of of big things that I think are worth mentioning. Um, one are solar solar materials that are transparent. Now, if you're a scientist, this sounds contradictory because to capture sunlight, you need to capture it in something that usually involves not being transparent. But there are types of solar materials that can are, are, are so efficient, really, that they can capture sunlight and turn it into electricity with an incredibly thin layer of the material, which would mean, you know, basically building skyscrapers where the glass, the, the glass windows in the skyscraper are actually continuously harvesting solar energy and turning that into electricity. So these materials are called perovskites. It's a type of material um, and they are very... They're not as good currently as silicon solar panels, the kind of blue, gray, dark solar panels that we see everywhere, the standardized ones, but they are catching up really fast. And I think that if we get to a point where our windows aren't just there to keep the elements out and to you know keep us warm inside, but they're actually generating their own electricity, that starts to get pretty exciting. And with everything related to climate change, uh, it's about a multi-stage approach. There is not one simple solution, which is why we can't be faffing about in the way that we are. We need to be taking every option we can and, and tying them together. And that type of energy harvesting technologies, um, that's a big, that's a really big part of it. Um, the other thing is that uh, as much of a fan as I am of electric vehicles compared to, you know, fossil fuel vehicles, the simple truth is that we we can't just replace every fossil fuel car with an electric car because that's not going to improve our quality of life for a start. Uh, a traffic jam full of electric vehicles is still a traffic jam. Um, so what we need really is is mo much, much, much more investment in, in mass transit, um, ideally mass transit that, that uses uh, renewable energy in order to move people around. Um, we have to get out of the mindset even if it's an elect even if it's a you know environmentally friendly private vehicle we really have to get out of the mindset of of using private vehicles to move around our cities it just doesn't make sense you can't keep building roads you'll always we have this thing called induced demand um you'll always you know build a new road it'll fill up build another lane it'll fill up uh, we cannot satiate the appetite <laughs> for roads <laughs> so we have to look towards away from private vehicles and towards mass transit vehicles 
And the other thing that has become increasingly urgent, and we've seen a lot in the last year, a few years, well, year in particular, is is flooding in our cities. Um, most cities are by urban or by waterways, either a river or, or the sea, um, because of what the access that gives us. But the downside of that is for the longest time, we have just paved over everything in these impermeable surfaces like concrete and tarmac that do not allow water to flow freely. So when we get flooding events, when we get massive storms, like those huge storms at the moment in Brisbane and in Australia, what ends up happening is the water has nowhere to go. So it just floods our cities. So something that I'm really interested in is this, it's what's called the sponge city approach. And that is where we design our infrastructure specifically so that it can cope with higher quantities of water. Now it's not perfect and there will still be amounts of water that it won't be able to cope with, but permeable pavements, um, designing public spaces so that parts of them could actually act like a sponge. They could hold on to flood water to give us a little bit more time. Um, we're starting to see lots more of that. And I hope that we start to see even more of it because the flooding in urban landscapes is just problematic on very very many levels and for for too long we have just assumed that we could be the masters of the water we can just look we can just you know cover over the river we can turn it into a canal it's all good but eventually the water will always find its way back in and we haven't really come to terms with that um so i'm very interested in in technologies and, and approaches to infrastructure development that that look to tackle that well, like the, I, I mean, I, I've noted those down. So, so solar energy being captured in almost tra in almost transparent or transparent, but yet being yeah. a very, very thin film and convert that into energy. Electrical vehicles, as you say, a traffic jam with electrical vehicles is still a traffic jam. And look at mass transit. And I want to talk to you about that a bit more. And then flooding, sure. particularly arising from impermeable. You have some lovely words. <laughs> impermeable. <laughs> and I've, I'd say a while ago now since I heard that, that, that word, probably since I studied physics myself. Um, Mass transit. Let's let's talk about that yeah. for the moment because, like you know, at the show here, we're very interested naturally enough in business business models and how those turn into stocks and investable propositions. Mm -hmm. Now, there it has been long since said that more, um, like we'll say the the type of travel that could be on really really high speed trains could actually replace air travel. Let me put that to you as a hypothesis. And um, the self driving car again that engineering wise has been possible uh, and has been now for quite some time but is it then Laurie it is it tangential areas is actually holding it back for example is it is it law and regulation is it that we know or another thing we know we could send a plane or, or a, a a vehicle uh, up up over the earth and then drop it back down so for me to go from Ireland over to you in New Zealand I wouldn't necessarily have to go around the sun I could go up and come down so when it comes to these types of areas, like what, what barriers do physicists and scientists come up against when you say, no, we have the, the technical solution, the other problems are the problems? Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly it. It's, it's very rarely a lack of technology that stops these things from happening. Um, the technology is usually there, but what lacks is a few things political will <laughs> for a yeah. start so investing in things like high speed rail infrastructure um you know here in new zealand there used to be a massive railway infrastructure and it's just shrunk and shrunk and shrunk in in the past century um it's going backwards in that regard you know we should be getting more and more trains but there needs to be political will and and usually these projects take a very long time to come to fruition and with fast changing you know um cycles of democracy that sometimes isn't seen as a priority um which is a real shame because if we you know we can do something amazing in 20 years but we definitely can't do it in the period of a single government so thinking longer term i think is is a huge bottleneck um regulation you mentioned that's that's a very good point as well um, we're seeing this already with autonomous vehicles right autonomous vehicles the technology is not perfect yet there's still a huge amount of work to do in that but actually there are much bigger questions around what does that mean legally? What does it mean morally if a, an, um, an automatic vehicle, like an autonomous vehicle, crashes into something? How will a car make a decision if it's in a situation where the option is to crash headlong into the wall um, and put the passenger at risk or to crash into a pedestrian walking on the street? how does a computer make moral decisions like that it doesn't 
right? That's computers aren't clever enough to do that. We have to computers are only they're only as good as what we tell them at the moment anyway. Um, so there, the big questions are around autonomous vehicles, particularly there's legal questions, you know, who is at fault in that situation? Is it the car manufacturer? Is it the person sitting behind the wheel, but not touching the wheel? Um, and then the moral questions around what that means. And then even on a smaller scale, there's the logistics of just moving around a city. If you're an autonomous vehicle, everything around us has been designed based on the technology we have. So we have stop signs, we have traffic lights, we have pedestrian crossings. All of those are based on the current paradigm of you know, mass transit and cars and pedestrians and cyclists moving around cities. You can't make eye contact with an autonomous vehicle, right? You, you know that thing if you're crossing a pedestrian crossing and you think like, has the driver seen me? You can look at the driver and make eye contact with the driver. And if you think about someone who's living with a disability or someone who's living with visual impairment, they already are, you know, at the mercy really of the urban infrastructure as we have it now. So it's not even optimized for them now. And we've seen many examples throughout history of of people in um some people being basically left behind in conversations around technology or infrastructure. Um, we don't design infrastructure to be accessible by default, certainly not in this part of the world. Um, accessibility is seen as like a bonus, which it shouldn't be. Mm-hmm. So there are loads of kind of legal and moral questions. There's political will. Uh, and usually, um, you know, you're having, you spend a lot of time firefighting. You spend a lot of time being like, no, no, this this will work. We need to do this. We can't keep waiting. We can't keep waiting. We've got to do this. And uh, yeah, you spend a lot of time firefighting as well too. But it's not to say technology is always the answer. It's, it's not, like it really isn't because technology is made by humans and humans are flawed. So technology can be flawed too. Um, but there are many, many things around d- adopting new technology that can stop it or slow it down. And just on before I go on here, I just want to read out a couple yeah. of comments here. So Maria has said, mm. amazing, I, I, I saw water generated from thin air. Love science, says Maria. Uh, Julie, who's Very based cool. in, in London, just remind you of that. Um, she said, permeable pavements, that's amazing. And um, James is telling us that he's just after joining now from Tennessee. Uh, I believe it's Tennessee. I see TN. So, so that's, where, that's where I'm guessing. Um, cool. In preparation for today, Laurie, I read a paper around the business of science. And I just okay. want to read out one particular statement. It goes back in history. And it's the flip side of what we've said, which is science on its own can't, sorry, not can't, often needs other things to mobilize it. So I'm just, just going just gonna to read this out to you. Technical advances in steam power, steel making, mechanical engineering and the like may have made railroads, railroads and mass production technically feasible. But it was a host of novel organisational and institutional arrangements like administrative hierarchies, professional managers, formalised capital budgeting systems, accounting and control systems, corporate governance structures that separated ownership and management that made them economically feasible. In fact... From my research of this today, railroads was actually the very beginning of big capital investment because you couldn't do something really big without a lot of money. And this was yeah. the one of the first reasons that triggered it. And secondly, is that if I, and I genuinely mean this, if I as an individual, if I'm going to manage this project, I may not have the money for this project. And I certainly may not have the risk um, appetite to take on the equivalent of billions today as a personal guarantee. So actually these really big technical and mechanical and engineering in ingenuity led to financial ingenuity as well. So yeah. can I also talk to you about, like particularly from your point of view of being a good communicator and teaching others to communicate, how yeah. important is it that science and business and economics and, and money works together properly? I think it's becoming increasingly important. And I say that because getting access to funding as a scientist is such a massive part of being a scientist it's so incredibly stressful constantly looking for more funding to do your work constantly trying to think two years ahead or can i get a phd student to work with me um can i set up a lab can i buy this capital you know this piece of capital that will allow me to do these measurements you are constantly looking for money um and there's a the pot, the pot of, of money available is isn't really getting much bigger in terms of you know government funding for example depending on where you are um so i think it's increasingly important that scientists have access to to funds you know from a purely kind of selfish <laughs> scientist point of view that they can have access to funds but also from the point of uh, the business point of view i think 
we scientists are interested in the idea. You know, we want to figure out the idea. We want to come up, we want to develop a, a concept or we want to test a theory. Um, I think from a business point of view, you're trying to actually make something real and you're trying to to make something, like you said, you know, make it practical, make it feasible, make it economically make sense. And I think that those two things are different, but I think we could all be, ben- we could all benefit if we worked more closely together. Um learning from each other, learning from the different viewpoints that we have. Um, and, and part of that comes back to, you know, making sure that you're talking to as, as wide an audience as you can. So like when I was in when I was in MPL, we used to have these industrial advisory group meetings every two years where we would bring people in from different industrial sectors and literally say, what are your problems? What are the things that you're struggling with in your industry? What's what's stopping your production of these materials what's uh, you know tell us what your issues are and then that would help us to decide how we would prioritize or our funding applications or you know come up with ideas for projects because we wanted them to be practical we wanted them to be useful in in the real in the real world <laughs> um, you know so i think that we i definitely think that we did some very good science in that context um but it is it is tricky. It is tricky to to tread that line because the other side of it is that if you want to publish peer reviewed research, you definitely want to make sure that you can do so independently and that your research is is completely neutral and doesn't have uh, any sort of bias led into it because of the funding. You know, so it is I think it is really complicated, but I do think we would all be better off if we if we did more of it. And on that note, then, I mean, is the proliferation of venture capital now where, I mean, I was talking to a business today. Um, you might be familiar with it, actually. It's called Let, Let's Get Checked. It's a, it's a company that started off in Ireland. And I mean, it's now, it, it's now raised its fifth round of funding and it's in the medical sphere. And mm. when I look at other companies, it, I'm going to say medical and healthcare because it's the easiest one to think to. It's a very tangible way we can talk about healthcare or talk about, talk about science. But... Mm. Is, I, is there is there more patience is there more patience now around deep tech like where we need mm. millions of data points in order to make an understanding autonomous vehicles I mean they, they didn't come about in the, the last couple of years so is the fact that there like you mentioned that there's we would say not exactly a growing pool of government funding but is there other in, like industry funding out there is there voluntary bodies out there is there um, university alumni or not alumni foundations out there investing in research mm-hmm. is, is there more is there more yeah there is more um and there are increasingly we are seeing kind of venture capitals capitalists looking towards scientific research uh, as a way to to invest in something that okay it might be high risk right when the process of doing science is by its very nature uncertain right it's about trying to explore something new so it is risky on some level it depends on the type of science you're doing as well mm-hmm. i think you you are we are seeing more interest um funding wise on you know sexy stuff right so if it's very timely if it's very urgent if it's something related to covid for example um there's definitely a bit much more available funding for that than there would be about something fundamental like how we measure time right um but actually in saying that uh, the measurement of time and the accurate measurement of time has has played an increasingly huge role in the stock market you know we we know that uh, you can't do any trading without atomic clocks anymore so um yeah so that is that is something that has a kind of an, an obvious financial connection um but yeah it does depend very much on the momentum um, it, it, your access to funding depends on what the wider momentum is. So you might get lucky and your research just ends up being something that it, that is particularly timely and, and you will see interest from people like venture capitalists. Um, but it is it is pretty patchy. I would say it's pretty heterogeneous across the and STEM think, sector. And that's why, you know, just going back to something you mentioned earlier, you said, you know, it's important mm-hmm. that we listen to various different perspectives and get a broad understanding of what's yeah. going on in the world. I mean, Laura, you've basically explained the reason I have the show is because I we brought people from various disciplines and I have so many more in, in the in the pipeline as well and um, I just also want you just to bring um, Maria here particular fan of yours I'd say at this stage just to, um, she says just as the stock market which reacts to politics and news uh, no matter the fundamentals good point Maria and she, she said but thank god for Vector S to combat that problem and she said I'm a fan of real real world application as well that's that's for sure because that's ultimately what matters let let me let me hit um let me go with the controversial one. Right. It would be 
I suppose it would be accepted that some cynical people out there, of which I don't include myself, but it's important that I have a voice of a cynic as well when I interview people like you. Do you think the world has ever buried a scientific development because the solution that that scientific development could bring would actually create another problem or would make profitable business unprofitable or would eliminate the need for something else so has science ever been told to keep quiet yes (laughs) many times um i mean the obvious one for me is is climate change we have known that the climate is changing and we have known what the possible implications of that are for many decades. This is not a new thing. We have known about it for a long time. The oil industry have known about it for much longer than they have ever publicly admitted. We know this because there's been heaps of research being done into, um, you know, you have you will have scientists who will work within an, the, an oil company who, who were literally saying to the chief executives, this is urgent. We must change our business. We cannot keep doing this. We are destroying the environment. And it was all packaged away and packaged away. There was a deliberate manipulative attempt to package away the science that we knew was true. All that's changed in, the, in more recent years is that our, our focus has become much sharper. So the general trends we've known about for a long time, even though they were buried. And all that's happened as we've learned more is that our models have gotten better. Things have gotten more accurate. Things have gotten more precise. Um, And there are people who've worked in climate change, you know, for 50 years. And for half of that time, they've literally just been bashing their heads against the wall, you know, saying, listen to us, listen to us, listen to us. But there's been a concerted effort with a lot of very, very big PR budgets to to bury that information. And so we're still at a point in the year 2022, we're still at a point where we have to argue with climate change denialists, even though the evidence is literally in front of our eyes. So there's so much wasted time in that. Mm. There's all this time that these, these climate change scientists have had to put into having these absolutely nonsensical arguments because the oil industry made the decision to pretend it wasn't a problem because it would affect their bottom line. So that's the most obvious one to me. There are a few others like um, tobacco industry um, is another one where where good science was was hidden away because it would affect profit margins. But yeah, climate change is the big one for me. I think it's the it's the biggest shame that we have as a as human society that we've let it get to this point. Wow, that's 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 quite. The- that's quite the statement. Um, I'm I'm conscious, Laurie, that I have I have very little time with you left. And on that note, I would like to talk about, of course, your most recent development, um, which is Sticky. So, I just just I gave an introduction before before you joined uh, about this book, and what what I'm intrigued by in it actually is only for it's you. I never would have picked it up, and I don't know whether <laughs> yeah. there's many people would agree. I really, yeah. I would never have picked it up. And only from um, having read it now, I what I see is that in some ways, analyzing stocks does the same thing, is that it gives you a way to look at everything differently. And it does. Genuinely, a- analyzing stocks give you, gives you a lens. It's almost like putting on a pair of glasses where from then you have another lens to look at the world. And what I'm learning in here is the way in which things like, you know, when, um, particularly when you're talking about paint, not, not rock art, when you, go on and you talk about the paint, you said how things can, can mix mechanically versus chemically. And then you go on, you talk about the geckos. And, and also the chapter that I love is all around the human touch as well. And I mean, so what, why we have you, could you tell us yeah. what inspired you to do this? And what is your, what is your hope with it as well? Yeah, um, I'll start with the hope. And I think the hope is is kind of what you said, Susan. I just want to encourage people to look at the world a bit differently and to realise that, number one, there's still loads of mysteries in the world of science. Because I think when I think about how science is taught in secondary school, it's kind of as if it's already done. We already know everything, which is absolutely not true at all. And I think that it actually that that fact, the idea that you're just supposed to learn stuff, you're just supposed to know stuff can put a lot of people off choosing to do science. Um, And in this book, there's been so many topics that I thought were settled. You know, I thought like, oh, yeah, we absolutely know, you know, why 
earthquakes happen. But actually, there are still some questions around really fundamental things that shape our world. And I, I love that. Like, I, I love a bit of a mystery. Um, I think that's that's why people do science is to try to answer questions. So that's the main thing is I, I just want to, to basically just take a little filter off people's eyes and just make them see the world a bit differently. Um, what inspired it was loads of different things. But actually, when I was writing Science in the City, I was writing a little bit about how trains move on train tracks and the fact that if there are leaves present, you genuinely reduce... It, it's not like a joke, like, oh, there's leaves on the line. The li- the leaves really do turn into this super, super low friction surface that stops the steel wheel of the train actually being able to grip onto the steel rail. And I thought, isn't that funny? There's something as fundamental as friction that we kind of know about, but it really can stop things. And it's only when it stops things that we realize how important it is. Um, and that was the kind of beginning of the idea that well, maybe I could write something about friction. That friction is basically the hardest topic in physics because it's really hard to study. It has so many applications. Its behavior is different on the scale of, say, like, um, you know, an earthquake and the scale of a few atoms. There's just, uh, it's just huge. It applies across all scales. So it's really difficult to to, to capture it in, in a small number of words, really. So this book for me has been my attempt at trying to unpack what friction is and how it shapes the world around us and how we interact with the world around us and how, how much of that is related to, to surface science. So yeah, covers geckos, earthquakes, ball sports, uh, winter Olympics, <laughs> uh, paints. It's got everything. It's got, it also tells you a bit about post-it notes and super glue for those oh, who are interested in products. Notes. Yeah, the whole, <laughs> so like- it's, it's just a bit of everything. It's, this, uh, it was a real fun experience. This woman is genuinely intrigued with the post-it notes. That 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 that, that is for sure. Um, it's true. Mar- Maria has just said it's going on my reading list. Thank you. And Julie says I want to read this book too. And yeah, I have to say it is. It's intriguing. And that's I I I have a guest coming up on the show in, in a couple of weeks' time, and I bought her book solely because I completely disagreed with its title. And in your case, as I say, because it was you, I, I said, no, anything that you would be doing would be very interesting to read. But it's also very interesting <laughs> to read what you just don't know you could be interested in. So, Laurie, we yeah. truly wish you the very best in all that you do. Keep in contact with the show. You're always welcome back. And thank you so much indeed for being here and being with us. No, thank you so much, Susan. It was such a pleasure. And, and thanks to everyone in the chat for engaging. And I'm on Twitter. Susan will tag me. So um, let me know if you guys read the book. I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I will tag her. There's no, no doubt about it. Thanks so much, Larry. <laughs> thank you indeed. Thanks, Susan. Have a good day. Bye, thank everyone. You. So there you go. There you have her. That is telling you all about the type of work that, that Larry does. And I just thought to myself... I really did thought, I sorry, I really did think that it was going to be very interesting just to get her perspective because many of the topics she brings up, I've spoken about in the ESG and tech show, but also I think it's very important. It's really important as well that as investors, we get a sense of what's coming down the track for sure, but also the bit that the scientific and business innovations that we are seeing because they are what will underpin companies in the future and their ability to generate the, the dividends and the earnings that we're looking for. Now, let me take a look over here. Um, I Yes, and I see there was just a question in there, Maria, that I unfortunately didn't get a chance to ask her. But Julie and uh, Maria, thank you for thanking her, and I would certainly p- pass that on. Now, what I'd like to do is I would like to take you through this evening. I would like to take you through some market timing. Um, I really feel that it's important, given where I'm based, uh, to talk to you about the, the situation that is that is happening right here. Now, I'm not going to be in a position at all uh, to talk through the like what's actually happening on, on the ground etc sorry i need to go to a different there we are yeah there we are um i'm not going to be able to talk about what's what's going on in the ground at all but i do want to talk to you about what is going on in the market accordingly and i read this this very interesting piece the weekend all around how many investor portfolios were not very much protected in the lead up to the invasion and the things that you can do about that now, in addition as well, of course, a lot has happened since, and I gave that webinar for all European, um, of our European customers on a Sunday night. Every second Sunday night, I deliver that, that session, and it's totally dedicated to the economic stories that are happening at the time, and then how they apply to the markets. Glenn's show, Trending Thursday, that is all around the, the financial market stories that are happening at the time, this company-specific topics that are happening at the time. 
in my case I take the economic trends so what I'm just going to do here is I want to start off by talking to you about them about market timing now I'm just going to uh, open up this and make it as big as I can okay which isn't very big here but don't worry you can you can read you can basically I'll, I'll guide you through what, what you need to see first of all over here on the right hand side you will see that we are in a confirmed down that means that this is the most this is the the, the most official and um, or the most um what's the word i'm looking for this is the last signal that effective s gives from a bullish or a bearish point of view so we are officially in a confirmed down call uh, and that means that the, from a most conservative point of view, we are now in, in a bearish condition. A more shorter term is when we would look at the primary wave and the primary wave is also down as of today. It's, it's down as well. There was a little bit of little bit of hope there during the week, but um, that hasn't materialized. And instead, particularly I would imagine since that fire last night, instead now it has moved to, to down. The market timing indicator. So the market timing indicator is very simple to read. Above one is favorable, below one is unfavorable, and again, that is from a market point of view. So what you can see here is, uh, well, I, I can, like, I know it's, it's difficult to see, so, so let me be your guide here. And that is the MTI level is at 0.63 at the moment. On the 15th of February, which is about three weeks ago now, that was at 0.74, so there has been a decline. Now, it, it has, it was lower actually uh, early last week, um, but it is it is on the decline again at the moment. Again, so all of those three would be the more medium term conservative measures. They're all pointing towards negative sentiment. Now, in the middle then, you can see our color guard in here. So there was a lot of red lights there, a lot of red lights in the lead up to the anticipation of the invasion. And now, as you can see, particularly since things have intensified, you can also see we now have three red lights. And a red light means that the price is up day uh, sorry is down day over day and week over week so that is where we look at the more shorter term now price is price refers to the our own index here at vectorvest so it's the vectorvest composite so it's a combination of all the stocks in the entire database so we look at all the stocks in the entire database come up with an index level and then we monitor that day over day and week over week as you can see that is red which means that the market is down day over day and week over week and then we also look at RT. Now RT is looking at the direction of the market. Is it up or down? Secondly, what is what is the dynamic of that? Is it is it very very volatile or is it quite calm? Uh, volatile is the answer at the moment. And uh, also the magnitude. So is it moving up quickly? Is it moving down quickly? Or is it being quite flat? At the moment, the or the RT is at point eight three. So below one is unfavorable, which means the market is going down. But the more closer that that goes to zero the more um the intensity is towards that downward trend so we are seeing an intensification of that so since last friday the rt was at 0 0.88 it's now at 0 0.83 and then finally the bsr the bsr is one that i i look for quite a lot um, and that is the buy sell ratio so the buy sell ratio is how we compare the number of stocks in the database that have a buy recommendation versus the sell recommendations so right now what we can see is we have 0 0.31 as the BSR. That means for every one sell, for every one buy recommendation that's in the database at the moment, there are three sells. Uh, when that goes to 0 0.2, that is a time at which we would consider the market to be oversold. We are there in Europe. We are there in Europe. And the reason I said, I'm telling you that, is I had an EU regional forum earlier on today with our European investors, and the BSR there is 0 0.19. So we are officially oversold. In Europe that's not to say that it's the time to buy not the time to say that it's, it's not at all the time uh, to say that we are we are ready to buy it that's when you need a, a trigger point to, to to go up however what if I didn't know any of that and what if I just wanted to know what's going on right now and how I might look at the world well that is what this is for and right now the color guard is bearish it is in negative bearish territory that is where we're standing at the moment. The color guard is bearish. So I wanted, first of all, there, there's three key things I wanted to tell you about this, about how to take care of your portfolio in a time like this. So number one is market timing, right? And of course, you can use market timing to help you make your decisions. Of course you can, depending on whether you are more, um, whether you're positive, uh, or sorry, not positive, to, depending on whether you're long-term or short-term, you can absolutely do that. And simply in the ways that I've shown you, 
and you can use the timing tab to help you with that okay so that's that's the first way but the second way is on a stock specific level so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move on in here to the system into the viewer and into the stock viewer okay right so in here you can now see the top I'm going to just take the top 10 stocks we've 9,157 9, I can see that up here so here we've got the top 10 stocks here, right? Steel Dynamics, you can see Diamondback, Matador, Nucor, PDC Energy, Alcoa, uh, Chenier, Ramaco, EOG, and Devron. Devron. All interest, I um, don't think anyone's surprised the fact that we've an awful lot of energy companies in here. So the point I'm making to you here is that how do I protect my portfolio? Well, there's two ways of doing it at the stock specific level. One of them is that this specific uh, every single stock has a specific stop, stop, S O T S T O P stop loss, uh, and in each case, I'm going to show you how to find that. Here it is. Here it is. So we can see here that this particular stock is 76.94, and the stop price is 64.14. So if I was to let me just graph all of these. Okay, here we graph all of these, and on my graph here. Just going to take off RT, I'm going to take off EST, I'm going to take, yeah, that's all I want. So you can see here is that for every single stock, every single stock, we have a stop loss. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make that line thicker. And here we are. So I'm going to make that line thicker. So here you can see what the stop loss is. So in this case, um, you can see that I am looking specifically at this stock. And therefore, I can see what the stop loss of that might be. And does anybody want to suggest a stock here? And I can take take a look at it. Um, pop pop your pop your uh, pop your stocks in here, and let's take a look at them. And I can compare the stop loss of your stock to, of what Vectorvest says related to what the price is right now. Um, so I see Marie says here we'll follow her on Twitter yep definitely please do please do go ahead and do that she's, she's super and you say so glad this doesn't bother me anymore no matter what the market is doing I've stopped moving up following the trend money grows where money goes uh, at Vectorvest that's right and of course it is Steve Chappell who also says that so please do pop your pop your stocks there into the chat and let's take a look at them and um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just do uh, okay so T-E-C-K let me take a look at that T-E-C-K. T-E-C-K cannot be found. Oh, that's because I have an apostrophe. Let me take a look there. So again, T-E-C-K. Okay. Tech resources, yeah. So, right, that's a beautiful looking stock. That is a beautiful looking chart. So here you can see the stock price has been rising. And let's say from last September, the stock was 19 up to 41.05. That's, that is a, a spectacular delivery there of a return. And, um, and in here, so the stop loss right now is 34.08. In comparison to the price is 4104. Um, two of you, both Julie and Jim, both are looking for CF. Okay, let me get that for you. CF. Okay, CF Industries again. Same same thing happening here again. So you can see round about last September, pretty similar situation. The stock was at 45, it's now at 91 and has been climbing massively, has is going through a huge gain, huge, huge gain uh, there now today. Um, I'm going to take, for example, uh, let me let me check. Uh, actually, do you know what I'm going to go for? Do you know what I'm going to go for is I'm going to go for what we saw there earlier um, in the list of Alcoa. Was it Alcoa we saw? Yeah, Alcoa. Alcoa here has a similar similar sort of graph that, that is looking at it at the moment. But if I was to take maybe a different industry, like what about, I've spoken to you before, for example, about paychecks. And if we were to take a stock like paychecks, as you can see, it's gone through a really, really, really steep decline. And as you can see right here and round about here in January, it actually triggered there into a sell recommendation. So the stock has been on a very, very bumpy ride since. Very, very bumpy indeed. Um, so you can see here, this is where the, the stop loss would have would have given it given it a lot of direction. So therefore, I'm going to um going to close close that graph there now. Uh, let me just get, I'm just going to get a stock. Um, let me get a stock where we are seeing a high R S as distinct to VST at the moment. Let me get one here now. And I'm looking for a whole, yes, here we are. So if we were to take, for example, United Health, 
United Health is up 1.72% today. And let's take a look at AMD Advanced uh, Micro Devices. Okay, so AMD and UNH. Okay, so here is AMD, or sorry, United Health. So as you can see here, the stock is now was up, up as far as 494 euro, and the stop loss right now is 453, a stock that has had a really, really stellar performance here over the past year. And then uh, the other one is AMD over here. And here in the case of AMD, you can see that it broke the stop loss. It broke the stop loss back here on the 19th of January. At that stage, it broke broke the stop loss, and now it's at uh, at that stage it was 128, and as you can see right now live, it is 107 dollars and 17 cents. Another stock that is coming in here is SQ. Okay, take a look there with SQ. Block. Mm. <laughs> so here's an example of where a stop loss is applied. So first of all, it was triggered with a sell recommendation back on the 10th of November. And then another one over here on the 22nd of November. At that stage, the stock was at 211. It's now less than half at 105.75. So there is an example of a stock as well that has uh, that has worked down through with stop loss. So that's the second way in which you can protect your portfolio. And I'm just going to bring us back here into the camera scene. The third way, of course, is that you can always use options as well. Particularly buying put options is like buying insurance for your stock. And what that means is that you're paying a premium, just like with any other insurance, you're paying a premium so that then if the stock falls through a certain level, if it falls through a certain predetermined price called the options price, which is the strike price, well, then you know that you can guarantee to sell your stock to the person who has sold you that put. And what that then gives you is a sense of insurance. Now, of course, like any insurance, it lasts for a certain period of time. You have to pay for it up front. And secondly, it's, you will then only get paid back ultimately what you've insured your stock for. Now, on the other hand, you can also sell put options. So if you are somebody where you feel that stock is rising, well then, and you are happy to buy that stock off somebody at the pre-agreed price, not alone will, can you lock that in. Well, you can't lock it in. You get paid to lock it in if the price falls below that level. But one last thing I want to say on this as, as we wrap up uh, our episode tonight is just remember is that if you also you want to buy, buy, take long exposure to a stock or an ETF where you feel the, mar the market is going to fall or the stock is going to fall, well then of course the price of your put option may also rise. So I just wanted really to bring that reflection to you during this episode is that is where the situation is at the moment conscious of my position here and uh, and just of my understanding of, of what's happening here on the continent and as a result wanted to talk to you about it but just remember that there are three key ways that you can protect your portfolio by using the vector vest system number one is market timing number two is those stop losses and number three is understanding options it has been my pleasure as always to be here and to be with you right throughout the episode this evening my huge thanks to laurie just delighted that she was able to be here and to have a conversation with us it's really intriguing to hear from her point of view and as i say i really wish her the best Again, if I could ask, please like the video if this has been of interest to you and you've enjoyed the conversation. And also, please do as well, join the mailing list, vectorvest.com forward slash FFF, FFF standing for Fantastic Female Fridays, so that you're on the mailing list for our next episode. And our next episode is taking place on the 1st of April. And I am going to have a woman that I have also been hoping to interview for a long time. And uh, she is Heidi Browning. She is the Chief Marketing Officer of the National Hockey League. So then we're going to take a look into that industry, look through her lens and to see what, what trends we can spot so that then we can get a good insight into the future of sports and the businesses around it. Thanks everybody and goodbye.